Hello, everybody. This is Nanette Kennedy with Humanities Team and the Evolution Revolution. And we are reading Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God book, uh, Tomorrow's God. And we are going to get started here in just a minute. And um, I'm going to let uh, Linda get everybody situated in where we are. And then we'll begin. Take it away, Linda. Okay. So we are on chapter 14, and that is on page 177. Uh, life's secret formula. And this is Neil speaking. If the Bible is right in saying that I am made in the image and the likeness of God, then you would look like a human being, right? Right. So, okay, that's that, when I want to. What? When I want to look like a human being, I would look like a human being. When I want to look like a shooting star, I would look like a shooting star. Here we go again. Well, you just can't get away from it. The truth will follow you around and find you wherever you are especially if you're looking for it. The point, the statement that you are made in the image and likeness of God does not mean God is like you, but that you are like God. Do you understand that? Well, I thought I did. Really? Do you understand the implications of that? Why don't you tell me what they are? If you're like me, that means you are not being, not a physical form at all, but can take the form of a physical being whenever you wish. It also means that you can take whatever other form you wish whenever you wish. This, by the way, you have done. It means that you are pure energy with the power of creation, expressing as a source of infinite wisdom and unconditional love. It means that you are not your body, but the essence that surrounds your body and creates it. It means that you are life itself, manifesting in a particular way at a particular time because it pleases you to do so. Well, I've got news. It is not always pleasing to be human. Well, indeed. For many of you, it is a displeasing much of it is displeasing much of the time. That is because you have forgotten who you are. You imagine you are separate from me, separate from life, and separate from each other. This imagining brings you the experience, and the experience of separation and illusion is the only thing that can bring you the experience of lack or insufficiency, another illusion. One illusion produces another, and this is the source of your displeasure. This is the source of your unhappiness. This is the source of your despair. Well, what is the solution here? Assuming this all is an illusion, how do we deal with it? How do we function within this illusionary world and, and still find peace, harmony, and happiness? What is the secret formula? Ah, now you're asking the fundamental question. And the answer? I can give it to you in one word. Well, don't let me stop you. Service. Service? Service to life itself. When you serve life, life serves you. That is because you and life are one, and service to life is service to you. This is why God's job is to serve you. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. Our, God, our job is to serve God. It is you who do not understand. Your job is not to serve God because God needs nothing from you. You thought that yesterday's God did, but the tomorrow's God will not. 
We will not have to serve tomorrow's God. No, you will not have to. It will not be a requirement. In fact, tomorrow's God will serve you. It is the function of God to do so. In fact, that is the eighth important difference between yesterday's God and tomorrow's God. Tomorrow's God does not ask to be served, but is the servant of all of life. Whoa, wait a minute. God is the master, not the servant. We are the servants. And it is ours to grovel at the master's feet. I tell you this. A true master is not the one who creates the most servants, but the one who creates the most masters. It is my joy to demonstrate to you that you are all masters. I do not need you to demonstrate to me that this is what I am. I already know what I am. It is you who have forgotten. I therefore place myself at your service that you might remember. And when you place yourself at my service, you demonstrate your own mastery. I thought you just said we will not have to serve you. I did, and you will not. Serving God will no longer be a requirement on the blessed day that you embrace tomorrow's God. Yet when you do serve God through your own free will, in that moment, you demonstrate that you need nothing, that you have everything, and that it is your great joy to give to God all that you have. And this is the definition of a master. Now, Substitute the word life for the word God in the above sentence, and you will have uncovered a secret formula for finding, indeed creating, peace, harmony, and happiness upon earth. Serve life first in everything you think and say and do. Ask yourself, is this thought life enhancing or life depleting? Is this word life enriching or life detracting? In, is this action life supporting or life damaging? These questions and the answers you give them become part of an automatic process, a process that you don't even have to think about when your intention is to preserve life as you know it on your planet. For when that is your intention, you will always preserve it. Yet you cannot serve life first if you think that you individually lack something. You will always be serving your needs, seeking to have them met before you can do that which serves life. On the other hand, if you know that you are life, then you will see immediately that serving life means serving yourself. This is the beginning way of all matters. Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, yes. Martin Luther King, yes. And you, me, no, I would not put myself in that category. That's the problem right there. I know, I, I know, but I just can't imagine myself at their level. You're talking about great human beings here. These are people who changed the world. Thank goodness their view of themselves is not as limited as yours. Yes, thank goodness. Yet if I wanted to think of myself in a new way, how could I do that? By not thinking of yourself at all. By thinking only of yourself. What's that supposed to mean? It's supposed to mean that when you think of yourself, you are thinking of the little self. But when you think of yourself, you are thinking of the big self. When you think of the big self, what Barbara Marks Hubbard calls the non-local you, you automatically play a bigger game, go for higher stakes, Seek a grander goal than is held in the limited vision of the little self. 
you begin seeing what is best for others is what is best for you because you know that you are those others. You are part of them. You are one with them. Now you are understanding. There are many kinds of service and your soul knows it when it is doing what is best for you and what is best for others. And when these two notions conflict, your soul knows how it feels to do what is best for others, even though it is not your idea of what is best for you. That feeling is the feeling of bigness. You suddenly feel bigger somehow, larger. It's a feeling of inner expansiveness. Some call it selflessness. It's when you've lost your sense of self as the little one and adopted a sense of self as a larger than that, bigger than that. You've become the big self. Sometimes for only a moment, sometimes for a larger period, sometimes for a lifetime. But the experience is something you will never forget. That's my biggest challenge in life. I always see my own personal agenda first. I always seem to serve the little self first. And I always want other people to serve it first too. It seems that I do things for other people only when I see that it serves me. If it does not serve me at some level, then I'm not there for them. I lost a a lot of important relationships because of that. How does that feel? Terrible. It feels terrible. So you haven't been serving your own agenda after all, then, have you? You haven't served yourself at all. No. Not if my agenda is to be happy, I haven't. How can I stop this? How can I let go of this behavior? You've recognized it. That's the first step. Doesn't seem like a very big first step. It is. Seeing one's own unwanted behaviors and claiming them, declaring them, owning them, is a huge first step. It is a step many, many people never take. It's too painful. And now you're sharing your painful experience with the world through this dialogue, and others will see themselves there as well. And they, too, will move closer to healing. Don't you see how this all works? We're here to wake each other up. I have already said to you, others see their possibility in the reality of you. Be, therefore, a model to all the world. You have stood as that for millions. You have laid your life open. You have been transparent. You have allowed your frailties and your foibles to be known by everybody. And your magnificence, too. Through your example, others are healed. Through the sharing of your pain, others are relieved of theirs. Through your experience, others have hope. This is how everyone can help everyone. All you have to do is tell the truth to each other about yourself. That's what my friend Brad Blanton says. He wrote a wonderful book called Radical Honesty. He believes in in what you're saying here right down to the letter. Truth is a form of service. Don't you see that? It is one of many forms of service one can enter into daily. And through blessed service, you will discover that you never needed anything and that lack was all an illusion. When you give away that which you thought you lacked, love, compassion, money, anything. You suddenly experience that you had it all along. You, uh, you suddenly experience that you had it all along to give all along. This changes everything. This turns your thinking completely around, allowing you to see that you have what you thought you lacked. You have it. You have it. Now all you need to do is multiply it. It's impossible to multiply something you don't have. But now that you know you have it, you can expand that experience easily. 
But remember, the experience ultimately has nothing to do with quantity. If you have a dollar and you give a quarter, it is as much as if you gave a quarter million when you have a million. You cannot quantify big beingness. You are either giving or you are not. You are either loving or you are not. Givingness cannot be quantified. Neither can love. You cannot love one person a lot and another person a little. You either love or you do not. How you demonstrate your love is another matter. Love may be demonstrated in many ways, but if it is love, it knows no condition, least of all the condition of quantifiability. So if I enter even more fully into service, my life will work more of the time? Your life is working all of the time right now. You simply say it is not working in the moments that it is not bringing you what you want. Well, isn't that a pretty good definition of life not working? No, it's a horrible definition. Your life is always working whether you know it or not. Sometimes it works to bring you what you want, and sometimes it works to keep you from what you think you want until you can mature and grow and see that it isn't what you would have brought you. The, it isn't what would have brought you the highest and best. That it wasn't your most next most beneficial step. This is hard to swallow. You know that you're standing here now trying to tell me that a family starving to death in some far flung place where people can seem to get, where nobody can seem to get any food or a child being raped by her father in a moment of unspeakable cruelty. Is life working? I know. I know. When you try to apply what appear to be simplistic explanations to complex life situations, the explanations seem to fall apart. Seem to. (laughs) Excuse me. They do. You cannot know the agenda of the soul. You can only know the apparent agenda of the body. You cannot even be absolutely certain about that, but you can make some educated guesses. Yeah, I would say so. For, an, for instance, it's a pretty solid bet that everybody wants to stay alive and that nobody wants to be hurt or injured or damaged in any way. That is a safe assumption a lot of the time. It is the survival of instinct at its most basic level. But there are other levels at which the essence of who you are survives and other reasons too. Hang on a second. Just hang on a second. Remember that I've told you, you are not your body. You said that every body wants to stay alive and that no body wants to be hurt. And that is correct. Yet your body is the most primitive basic expression of the life form that is you. Another level of expression, the life form that is you, may have a different agenda. You do not know unless you do. Some human beings are deeply in touch with the totality of who they are all of the time. Some are in touch part of the time. Some are in touch once in a while, and some are not in touch at all. When you are in touch with the totality and the essence of who you are, everything looks different. Suddenly, what seemed important is not important. What appeared to be critical becomes trivial. What mattered no longer matters at all. Life being physically assaulted like being physically assaulted or dying of starvation or crucified on a cross? No fair. None of us are gods here. Correction. All of you are gods here. Has it not been written, ye are gods? End of chapter. Thank you, Wanda. Who would like to start their conversation or the an observation about this chapter. Uh, 
Oh, well, I would just like to say that um, I love this chapter. Of, you know, all the books repeat themselves um, and we, the material sort of repeats in different forms, but um, it's always great to hear who we are and what we are. And um, I just loved it. Thank you, Linda. I agree. My favorite quote was kind of early where it said, true masters aren't creating servants, they're creating other masters. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. It's a beautiful chapter, I agree. I could, I could say something um, on just sort of, re, you know, when we are all one, there's no competition. So no matter what the other one, if, if we're all connected, there's no need to ever, when you have the thought that there's a competition, that's kind of a mistake. That's, that's feeding the small cell of separation. Yeah, that's just I what I... Uh, I'm trying to find it. There's a place where God says, like, he's talking about, is this, it, it's not, I don't have a word to write, but is this what you want to say? Is this helping? Is that helping? Is that helping? And I'm trying to find it because I, it, it's really kind of a critical piece. I think um, the competition comes in because we have forgotten who we are and we don't understand that we are one. If everyone understood that we are one, then we would have, have no competition. Okay. Exactly. You know, um, it's funny. I had a an image come to me because I'm I'm good. I've well, I shot it already. I've actually shot this video twice. And I have to redo it a third time. But I'm doing a video on the idea of what you resist persists and trying to explain it. And in, in the meditation of that, I, I, I had this image come to me. So, you know, a circle is one of the best ways to describe oneness, right? We're all, if you imagine, we're all like dots on the edge of the circle. We all make up that circle. And then I was meditating on, well, what would happen? So we're all standing in a circle, right? What would happen? How would it impact the circle if somebody in the circle started looking across at the person on the other side of the circle and hating them? What would happen? What would happen to the shape? And, and I got this, this visual of the shape actually as, as people are hating on each other and then other people are trying to love on each other that it becomes this sort of first it sort of flattens out into like an oval or a long oblong and then the energy of people trying to overcome that actually would sort of pinch it in the middle and it would become twisted and you've got an infinity symbol so the infinity symbol is great for showing how the energy flows right because when you look at a circle, you don't think of energy flowing around that circle. 
Like it's not second nature to us where I think it's sort of second nature when you look at an infinity symbol to, to think that, well, that's, you know, the energy's in an endless loop here, but the energy's in an endless loop around the circle. And that's what we're trying to get back to is that wholeness. I don't know if that made any sense, but I just thought I'd share it anyway. Um, I made, I think I, I think you made sense. I can't talk, but I think you made sense. Um, and I'm thinking about this whole thing of competition because I'm real torn on that subject. Um, I, I think that a lot of people, that's part of their, um, part of their makeup so that they know that, because if I see somebody doing really well at something and I think, and it's not a jealousy, but I think, wow, I'd like to be that good at that. Um, it can somehow inspire me to do better than I am, which goes back to being better than what I am myself. So I have a little trouble with the, the idea of no competition. And I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And this is not the first time we've read this in these books. Um, over. Um, no, no, I don't. Okay, go ahead on. Oh, sorry. I, I just thinking. Okay, thank you. Um, what I understand, like, is uh, competition is when you try and take what the other one has. If you try and improve yourself because of the way the other one is, that's fine. That's not. That's just inspiration, isn't it? That's you're inspired by how good they are at that. You feel like okay. I can up, I can improve. Um, it's just when we um, compare ourselves to the other one, that's, that's the root of, uh, you know, um, jealousy and envy, how I understand it. Comparing yourself to the other one. But if you're just comparing yourself, you're just sort of thinking, I could do, I'm inspired by how, um, how skillful they are there and how lovely that is. And wouldn't it be great if, uh, you know, I could, uh, improve my my skill as well that, that's a that's the kind of inspiration i think that's fine i think that's that's good that's adding to the how good how 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 marvelous we can be we we could be a lot of things we could do a lot of things maybe you know according to this we could do we can do everything is possible that's very good, Anne. Thank you for suggesting that. I, and I, I think she, she hit it on the head. And the thing is, is that if you take that inspiration and then you take it one step further and you go, gee, I'd like to be that good so I could beat them. Now you've moved wow. from inspiration into competition. Right. Well, and I was actually thinking of, because of the uh, recent death of Kobe Bryant is that I've heard so many people speak about uh, what an incredible athlete he was and because I'm not much into basketball um, although I knew he from you know I'm not living in a cave so I know that he was he was excelled in his sport um, and I watched a special it's real short. It was a YouTube video where Jimmy Kimmel was saying that he made other people want to do better. And that to me is what that's, that's the good thing that comes out of that is it makes somebody else want to do better than they're doing. Not necessarily, well, I want to do better and be better and be more important than he is. I, I get that. I think I was just confused on the understanding of that, but thank you.
I found that paragraph. It says, serve life first in everything you think and say and do. Ask yourself, is this thought life, is this thought life enhancing or life depleting? Is this word life enriching or life detracting? Is this action life supporting or life damaging? And I was thinking about it as I was reading it. Um, I was, t- I tweeted something at Lindsey Graham this morning and now I've got to think about it. You know, was it life enhancing? Probably not. So um, I think that that's a, it's a great, that right there is just a great paragraph for us to sort of write down and carry with us to remind us of, of how we want to make our choices because why would we want to choose anything if it wasn't life enhancing? And so even though, you know, I, I do go through my life every day feeling like I'm serving life, um, I might not be serving it the best I could. I realize. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I think that these explanations and thoughts and uh, that have been mentioned here by Anne and Linda and others is that it's, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be, you know, like a little girl who looks up to, I'm just going to use Michelle Obama as a example, but a little girl who looks up and says, I could be the president's wife someday, or I could be the president someday. There's, that's not the kind of thing that is being discussed here because there's obviously a race involved for whoever becomes the president or leader of a country. Um, but if it is, inspires um, someone to do better for themselves in order for being better for a lot of people, um, then I think that's a good thing. And I'd like to take this moment to welcome Ken, Don, and Jeanette. Thank you for joining us. Um, anyway, Linda, were you going to say something else? No. Okay. And welcome Janet, too. It's nice to see you here. And because of competition of the Super Bowl, I think we don't have as big of a crowd as we usually do with our regular people. <laughs> um, but that's okay. Anybody else have a comment they want to add? Can I say something again? Sure. I, I know how I know how to check in that I'm doing okay. I mean, I know how to check in with my body if my body feels expanded or contracted. So that's how to check in as to whether what you're thinking or what you're doing is um, you can breathe. You can breathe easy, more easily when you're expanded, when you're in serving life and you are more constricted in the breathing when what you're thinking and what you're doing and intending to do is, not, is serving your small self. So it's a, it's a good way of checking in, you know? That's a very good point. Um, shall we go ahead and read some more of this chapter or the next chapter? Sure. Okay. And that's everybody up for it. Yeah. yeah. I, do you want to tell us what page for everybody's benefit? Sure. Uh, so we're on page 189. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to read the very last of uh, the chapter before because it's God speaking and then it'll be Neil speaking. So God says, correction, all of you are gods here. Has it not been written, ye are gods? Chapter 15, is God needless? Of course, I've heard that before. I tell you, needlessness in the state of being is the state of being in which God resides. God needs nothing. You also need nothing, but you do not know this. 
So you are constantly going around trying to have your needs met. Once you reach mastery, however, you realize that there was nothing you had to do. Your needs were always met. In fact, you did not have any needs. You were making them all up. People move in and out of mastery around this all the time. They understand it one moment, fail to understand it the next. Needlessness is not a quality of personal being that you think about. It is something that you know about yourself at the deepest part of your being. When you come from that knowing, you can do extraordinary things. A woman jumps into the pool to save a drowning toddler, even though she herself cannot swim. Not because she thinks about it, but precisely because she does not. In that moment, the woman knows. She knows all about herself and that she needs nothing. She does not even need her own life. She does not even think about it. She simply jumps into the pool. She sees the toddler falling in, and she doesn't think. She jumps. She reaches the baby, pushes it above her head. Someone takes the child. Then the woman has to call out for help to get herself out of the pool. She makes it. And she's all right. And when someone asks her how she thought she could possibly save the child when she can't even swim, she says, I wasn't thinking. I just knew what I had to do and I did it. This is instinct overlaid with story. It is your cultural story playing itself out as action in moment-to-moment life. The basic instinct is survival. That is life. And your cultural story tells you what you have to do to preserve life, not even your own. It is life outside of you you will seek to preserve. Something inside of you, something at the cellular level, tells you that life inside you is not the issue. So it is that the mother, so it is that the mother bears flight, fights. So it is that the mother bear fights off the hungry tiger to save her cub. It is instinct. It is about the survival of your species. This is the instinct you have been ignoring. The survival strategy of human beings is killing you. You are being destroyed by your own cultural story. What you hold in your subconscious is a series of messages that have been placed there when you were very young. The placers of the story were the tellers of the story, namely the elders and caretakers in your community of origin. And the first thing they told you was that you need something. You need something to be happy. You need something to be acceptable. You need something to be successful in the world. You need something. That is the message of your culture. Your media reinforces it at every turn. Your present religions from which you hope to receive the highest wisdom tell you this. They tell you you need God and God needs you to behave in certain ways. What humanity would benefit from right now is a new cultural story. That is what, that is what the new spirituality is all about. That is what tomorrow's God has to share. This sharing will occur in many ways across many moments in many lands offered by many people. It will be part of the work of those people who have chosen to join together to work as one for the healing of humanity's collective consciousness. Well, I've said this about, uh, I've said, we've said a lot about this here and now, but I have to tell you, that the idea of a God who needs nothing or a deity who is not needed by us for anything is going to be pretty hard for most people to embrace. Either meaning is deeply confrontational. God will be needless? Wow. Tough one. I know you present theological construction of a God who has needs that must be met is the basis of your entire belief system. And your present conceptualization of yourselves as helpless, needy beings, depending on a needy God, deeply reinforces it. This is a recipe for dysfunction in any relationship. 
It is no wonder that humanity's relationship with God is barely functional. Humanity's relationship with God is becoming less functional every day as people try to apply the concept of a God who needs something to their lives and begin using jetliners turned into missiles and smart bombs as tools to which, with which to do it. Remember, life is obedient to three basic principles. Life is functional, adaptable, and sustainable. When it moves towards the edge of functionality, when it cannot function much longer the way it is going, it adapts. Life on Earth is about to adapt. It cannot go on like it is. Something is going to have to change, and it will. Life will not let life down. It will adapt. Often it has been said here, now, and often it should be said everywhere around the world. This adaptation could take the form of life changing dramatically from the way you have known it on your planet with your civilization's best days behind it, Things are already moving in that direction. Or it could take the form of complete transformation of your planet with its people living together in a new way, retaining the best of yesterday and wrapping it in the highest hopes for tomorrow, in which case your civilization's best days will lie ahead. So we have no choice but to accept this idea of a needless God this is the theology of the future. This is the nature of tomorrow's God. You always have a choice. If you observe that your present theology works, that it is functional, that it is producing peace on earth, goodwill to humans, then change nothing. Do not even think about change. Why change when everything is going so well? But if you observe that all the religion's instruction from all the world's great religions through all the years has done little to move humanity from the brink of self-annihilation, then you may wish to, at the very least, entertain the possibility that there is more to know about God and about life. There is no requirement that you accept this idea of a needless God, but can you at least look at it? Are you willing to explore it? Can you open up your mind to the possibility that this might be, at minimum, worth examining more closely? Because the problem with your world today is that too many human minds are closed. You imagine yourselves to know everything there is to know on the subject of God. You are willing to continue exploring other things. You are willing to explore new developments in science. You are willing to explore new procedures in medicine. You're willing to explore new theologies in, or theories in economics. You're willing to explore new approaches in education. You're willing to explore new frontiers in outer space. You're willing to explore new adventures in psychiatry, psychology, physiology. But many of you, most of you, are unwilling to explore any new ideas at all in your theology. That is blasphemy, you say. That is apostasy. That is unallowable. And in some cases, that is punishable by death. Yet now, here, I bring you an invitation to both explore and experience a new spirituality, and then to work with others to create the space of possibility for that new spirituality to emerge across the globe. Okay, so let's keep exploring. What is the other foundational truth of this new spirituality? What is another foundational truth? Unconditionality. Is that even a word? It is now. Right? It is a state of being having no condition at all. I don't understand. Life is. It simply is. There are no conditions to that. 
there are no conditions under which life is not. Oh, I don't know. There are some people who would say that when you're dead, life is not. Now, they would be wrong. The condition you call death is not death at all, but life in another form. Yes, I know. I understand this larger truth. You have shared it many times before. All of the greatest world, all of the world's great religions agree on this. So, life exists without any conditions. That means that God exists without any conditions. That means love exists without any conditions. Remember that the words God, life, and love are interchangeable. All three are one. And this is the Holy Trinity. True love is unconditional. Love that places conditions is not love at all, but a counterfeit version of it. Real love, like the real love, like the real God and like real life, knows no conditions. Conditional love is an oxymoron. Because this is true, the idea of a God who places conditions on the receiving of his love is unworkable. It is a contradiction in terms. Yet this is the idea you have have had about yesterday's God, requiring you to try with all your might to get close to a God of whom you are deeply afraid. Love and fear are mutually exclusive because they cannot exist simultaneously in the same space. Humans have a massively conflicted relationship with yesterday's God. It is not insignificant that the single most oft-given instruction of virtually every spiritual teacher is fear not. There is nothing to fear from God because God wants nothing from you. Nothing. Here we go again. This is so hard, so very hard to accept. Yes, I know, because you have been taught of yesterday's God much, and worse yet, does not have the ability to meet his needs by himself. And so, must take demands, must make demands on you. And you have been taught that if you do not meet these demands, God will judge you, condemn you, and punish you. I know, I know, I know all about that. And this brings us to the ninth important difference between yesterday's God and tomorrow's God. Number nine, tomorrow's God is unconditionally loving. Uh, just one Judgment. second, Linda. Non- to, let me finish the sentence and I'm stopping. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 955. This is the perfect sentence to end it on. Let me just finish the sentence and I will stop. Tomorrow's God is unconditionally loving, non-judgmental, non-condemning, and non-punishing. I'm stopping. And I'll do the next sentence. Don't I wish that were true? <laughs> Sorry, Linda. This, uh, this is an absolutely remarkable chapter. Um, is it all right if I do the meditation? Yes, that's, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Linda, before I begin, I'd like to apologize. Um, it's very frightening. The whole chapter is very frightening because it turns everything upside down. And this last sentence was probably the uh, most frightening. <laughs> It's really very scary. Angela, Anne, Don, 
Ken, Linda, Mary, Nanette, and I are joining our hearts here now to accept the fact that service to life or love or God is based on unconditionality and the fear which has resulted in judgment, condemnation, and punishment is history. So we pull our power as gods because we are gods. And we thank you that that infinity symbol, which is basically a dented and squashed circle, is now restored to its original perfection. We thank you all for exercising God power as expressed and communicated by Linda to restore Gaia and humanity to their intrinsic perfection. Amen. We accept that we're infinitely powerful and infinitely peaceful. Amen. And our vibration now is restoring everything to its perfection, peace, and joy. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will see each other next Sunday, same time. Stay healthy, Lynette. Thank you, and everybody else stay healthy and on the ball. And we shall meet again. So thank you, Anne, Shabana, Angela, Linda, Mary, Don, Ken, and then Linda's other line, in case you didn't hear me the first time. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, love you all, and we'll see each other next week. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye. Love you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.